Welcome to Dead Meat, the horror channel with that one dude with the hair. That one dude is me, James A. Janice, and today I'm going to be ranking the four Scream movies from worst to best. In an effort to tailor the ranking system to each specific franchise I cover, my criteria for judging these movies include how well it's made, like the writing, directing, acting, etc., how scary and funny it is, since all the Screams try to be scary and funny, how good the ghost face reveal is, how fun or entertaining it is to watch, and since my main series is The Kill Count, I'm kind of obligated to judge the kills, even though, let's be real, it's Scream. They're mostly knife stabs. As always, I'll try to say what I like about all the movies, even the the ones I rank low. Now let's grab our phones and voice changers and get to the rankings. Number 4 In last place is the original Scream. <laughs> nah, I'm just messing with you, it's Scream 3. Of course it's Scream 3, it has to be Scream 3. Scream 3 is what you'd get if a 5th grader watched the first two Scream movies and was told to make another one, but the only film equipment they had was a piece of fresh dog shit. It's bad is what I'm trying to say. Let's start with my biggest annoyance, that GD voice changer. But James, they use a voice changer in all the movies, why are you so butthurt? First off, don't say butthurt, you sound like a 10 year old. Second off, the first two movies featured simple and realistic voice changers. No matter who you were, you talk into the thing, you get sexy sneering ghost face voice. Voice. Surprise, Sydney. Side note, Roger L. Jackson's voice performance is one of the best things of the franchise. Dude kills it, just like he does when he's Mojo frickin' Jojo. But in Scream 3, the new device allows you to perfectly imitate another human being's voice and speak original words and sentences in it. Dewey's, Dewey's got, got our voices. That just, like, phonemes don't work that way. Talking about how much fun it's gonna be to rip your insides out! You can't do that from the other side of a door with a little handheld device. That's insane. The Scream movies are bound in realism. Their whole premise is staked on the fact that this is our world with our rules and logic. This voice changer, especially when it's such a huge part of the plot, completely undercuts the movie. Not that there's not plenty of other stuff that's bad here. The convoluted gas explosion death is like a mousetrap of factors leading up to it. And everyone knows the mousetrap setup never goes off without a hitch. Two promo shots taken 28 years apart aren't about to have the same lighting, blocking, and composition as each other. And there's no realistic way that Roman could have stopped his pulse at the perfect time for Gale to check it and determine he was dead. Speaking of Roman, can you say worst ghost based ever? And there's some decent competition in that field. Scream 3 has such a huge cast running around, and they pick the most bland and forgettable dude to be the big reveal in the end. When he takes his mask off, even Sid just stares blankly, trying to remember who he is before he has to tell her. Roman Bridger, director. Oh, you mean the dude who wore glasses in every other scene in this movie? And while I'm not entirely against retconning during a series, making Roman the evil mastermind behind Billy and Stu takes away from those characters. I'm a director, Sid. Yeah, Roman, that's like the one and only thing we know about you. We got it. On the subject of fake movies, it's dumb that they're making Stab 3 but have location sets and props from Scream 1, which was already covered in Stab 1 in Scream 2. I can't. I can't with this. Some of these points may seem like nitpicking, but they're all symptomatic of a film that just didn't care enough to try to be a good Scream movie. Maybe it's because it was the only Scream not written by Kevin Williamson, the guy who came up with the series in the first place. I could go on and on about problems I have with this movie, from the Jay and Silent Bob cameo, to the spooky scary ghost mom, to the severely toned down kills. But I've got three more movies to cover, so I should probably wrap this up by being fair and pointing out the things I did like about it. Even in a sea of wasted actors, Parker Posey manages to stand out and give a fun performance that makes her scenes actually entertaining to watch. We get a Carrie Fisher cameo, that's never not good. I'm also down with how they handled and concluded the Dewey Gale art. Hashtag Team Gooey. Kincaid's partner Wallace is like the Creed Bratton of the movie. Not in it a lot, but funny when he is. He was making a movie called Stab. He was stabbed. Right, this is the scene where you come with us. After they realized how much of a mistake it was to kill Randy in part two, I like that they came up with a halfway decent way to work him into the third movie. And, uh, I don't know, man, that might be it. This movie sucks. Number three. Coming in at number three is Scream 2. I had a real hard time coming to a decision on these middle two spots, and I'll admit that the amazing podcast We Hate Movies might have influenced me a little bit when they covered this movie. I like Scream 2 enough, it at least tries to be a respectable movie, unlike the cartoony part three, and it still focuses mainly on Sydney, which is less true in the movies that followed. Nev Campbell is great conveying the trust issue Sid has because of the first movie, and the new additions to the cast are all solid, including Lee Schreiber as a wigged out cotton weary, aggressively trying to prove he's innocent, and Laurie Metcalf as a straight up crazy lady. And there's an impressive increase in the brutality to the kills. It may be less creative than the ones in the original, but they're just as serious, and of course, a lot more numerous. But on closer examination, you'll find weird things that probably came from the super rushed production and the continuous onset script rewrites. One of the biggest examples is Mickey being the killer, a ghost face reveal just as lame as Roman's. The dude seriously isn't seen once in the 45 minutes preceding his big reveal. What kind of shit is that? And that's coming from someone who loves Timothy Oliphant and the way he manages to rock my hairline. It's the last scene we see him in before 
before the big climax that also single-handedly knocks this movie below Scream 4. It's that god-awful cafeteria scene, where Sid's boyfriend Derek starts giving a performance of the Partridge Family that absolutely nobody asked for or wanted. I Don't. think I love you, isn't that what life is made of? This bit goes on forever as he dances around on tabletops like he's a polo-shirted Fred Astaire. Add in Mickey's obnoxious dancing and him trying to orchestrate the rest of the students in this cafeteria when they're just trying to grab lunch between classes, and my body is clenching with secondhand embarrassment. To top it all off, the background music sounds like it's from a corporate retreat video scored by the Verve. <laughs> In general, Scream 2 feels like an imitation of the original that needed more time in the oven. It could also shave off like 10 minutes. Thing is two hours long. What are you trying to do, Scream 2? Win an Oscar? Take out the thespian Sydney storyline. That's not doing anything, other than setting up for a ridiculous climax wherein Laurie Metcalf is partially defeated by foam rocks and fake paper flames. That's as silly as the idea of a knife going through a bathroom stall partition cleanly and accurately enough to kill a dude. It's as silly as not demasking or choking out Ghostface when you're climbing over his unconscious body. It's as silly as that film class discussion that's just an excuse for the movie to be meta. And give Joshua Jackson some acting practice after the Mighty Ducks movies. Basically, this is a movie that tried to be serious and ended up a little silly, which is admittedly better than Scream 3, a movie that tried to be silly and ended up a flaming trash can of a movie. Number 2. Like I said, I had a hard time deciding, but my number two Scream movie is Scream 4. Ultimately, I think it came down to Scream 4 having great gore and not having that horrendous cafeteria scene. God damn, I hate that thing. I'll be honest and say I was kind of fundamentally against this movie even existing, since I felt like the Scream storyline was pretty strongly concluded after the OT. But it is fun to check back in on so many characters over a decade after we last saw them. Also, I greatly appreciate how Scream 4 course corrects the tone of the series after Scream 3 veered uncontrollably towards comedy. The movie does a good job bringing the series out of the 90s, updating the technology to include live streams and viral videos, and updating its genre commentary to include discussions about reboots and the Saw-type movies that had come out since Scream 3. It's not scary, it's gross. I hate all that torture porn shit. Stab being on the seventh installment is pretty funny, and that joke's part of the double fake-out meta opening, which doesn't make complete sense when you really think about it, but is a perfect culmination of how this series talks directly to the audience. There's still a lot of things that bug me, though. Woodsboro looks distractingly different to me, although that might just come from my recognition of the shooting location, Ann Arbor, Michigan, home of the leaders of best. I don't like all the red herring characters who are creepy for no reason. Scream 3 was bad enough with Kincaid and Angelina, but Scream 4 is worse, with Deputy Judy emerging from the shadows like she's about to ask where her precious is, and Sydney's Aunt Kate talking wistfully and making midnight grocery runs. Also, it's a relatively small thing, but where did they come up with their big rule for horror remakes? In fact, the only surefire way to survive a modern horror movie? You pretty much have to be gay. Maybe I just haven't seen enough reboots, but can any of you give me any examples of the supposed phenomenon. I'm also a little annoyed that they didn't have the guts to kill off any of the main characters. If you're coming back to an established series after such a long absence, air that shit out, man. Inject some life with a death. Really force awakens it. Instead, all three OG Scream stars survive, even though Courtney Cox is sidelined for almost the entire third act. At least the ghost face reveals make sense, as obnoxious as the characters are. Both Charlie's trademark entitled Nice Guy and Jill's fame-seeking reality TV sociopath are believable murderers for a horror movie in the 2010s. And near the end of the movie is Jill's self and inflicted harm sequence, one of my favorite things in the entire franchise. That's some good stuff. Finally, Scream 4 has Hayden Panettiere, the MVP of the new cast. So much great face acting, and she's such a likable person. In a perfect world, Wes Craven would have gone on to make a second Scream trilogy about Kirby, which I realized was a possibility with her open-ended fate until, sadly, Craven passed away a few years ago. Before it came out, I thought Scream 4 was unnecessary, but the movie managed to convince me that the series was worth updating, even if it didn't execute all those updates perfectly. Okay. Probably would have helped if they had wiped all that Vaseline off the camera lenses when they shot it. Seriously, next time a horror series makes a long-awaited sequel, it should probably avoid lighting it like a softcore porn. Number 1 there was never any question about the top spot on this list. The original Scream is the best Scream, because it's one of the best horror movies of the 90s. There's a reason this movie upended the entire genre and put horror movies back into the mainstream. It was self-aware, it was funny, and it was scary too, dude. The opening scene to Scream is one of the greatest opening sequences in a horror movie ever. Not only does it establish right away that these characters know and love all the same horror movies we do. Listen, it was Jason, I saw that movie 20 goddamn times! Then you should know Jason's mother, Mrs. Voorhees, was the original 
killer. But it freaking kills off Drew Barrymore just 12 minutes in. That chick was all over all the promo materials. It's a perfect scene of ever heightening tension between Ghostface's increasingly hostile calls to the Jiffy Pop stovetop fire, and both deaths in it are graphic enough to let you know this isn't just going to be a comedy. In fact, most of the kills are solid. While the later Scream movies would feature kills that were almost always just stabbings and shootings, this one's got the infamous garage door death as well as the shocking end to Stu Mocker. And do you even want to get me started on the tour de force that Matthew Lillard gives? Ow, liver, 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 it was a joke. Yeah, it might be a little over the top sometimes, but he's giving it his all, as is the rest of the cast. Nev Campbell establishes Sidney Prescott as a strong yet relatable anchor to the story and would remain the strongest asset of Scream for the entire series run. Jamie Kennedy bought so much goodwill as Randy that I saw Malibu's Most Wanted in theaters. And Skeet Ulrich, as Sidney's entitled boyfriend Billy Loomis, is greasier and grimier than a glob of gopher guts. And that's another thing, these ghost faces are the best two of the series. They're a great combination of reason and chaos. Billy acts as the mastermind, mad about Maureen Prescott's affair that helped break his parents up, and whining over blue balls that he blames on Sydney. You see what you do to me? While Stu's motivation is more terrifyingly random. Peer pressure. I'm far too sensitive. But also because, let's be real, dude's in love with Billy. Look at these two. I ship them so hard. Few movies can successfully strike a humorous tone while still making you take it seriously. But because Scream puts his likable hero in constant danger, all while presenting a great whodunit mystery that keeps the audience engaged, it's able to be funny without ever sacrificing its authority as a horror movie. I don't care how cliche or common an opinion it's become, I freaking love the original Scream and will forever respect its impact on our favorite movie genre. And that's my list. If you missed any of the Scream kill counts, hit up the playlist linked right over there. And apologies yet again to my Canadian viewers, for whatever reason, the Scream 2 kill count was blocked in your country. I don't know, man, that shit just happens to me. I hope they never make a Scream 5, since Wes Craven wouldn't be involved, but if they do, you know I'll cover it on the kill count. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been Dead Meat.